I'm glad to be able to speak to um, our patients. That's what we do all this, all the work we do for, and obviously we all take care of patients day to day as well as doing research. Um, there, I'm hoping that my talk will kind of briefly provide a little kind of overview and perspective on things that you have heard and talk a little bit about future directions as well as a couple of specifics. There's no way to talk about everything that's new um, in one uh, brief presentation, and a lot of what's new has been mentioned already in some level, um, but I'll, I'm going to cover a few things. So this is, again, my disclosures. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, adoptive T-cell therapy, um, personalized cancer vaccines, and personalized approaches for, for selection of therapy. Um, and because really the direction I think we all see, and um, Dr. Snowell has already discussed this to some degree, that the future where we all want to be and see this field going is trying to personalize therapeutic decisions and not just pulling things off the shelf that we give to lots of people as we've done for a long time. And immunotherapy gives us the opportunity to do that, but there are a lot of questions still about how to do that. Um, I thought it might be useful instead of thinking about what, what we're trying to do with immune therapy to, to kind of make some comparisons there. These two people have two things in common. So Shannon Miller, who is an Olympic gymnast, um, most decorated gymnast uh, ever in U.S. history, Mario Lemieux, who's a hockey player called the Magnificent One for his uh, expertise. And they both also had cancer, and they're both cancer survivors. And it's, uh, um, it may be useful to think about the fact that in, in, their, in their initial um, claim to fame in getting um, to, the, to the level of being an Olympic medalist, Olympic gold medalist, um, they had to work very hard to train the bodies that they were given to do things that they weren't normally able to do, and that most of us don't do because we haven't trained our bodies to be able to do that. And in fighting cancer, um, we're dealing with a situation that the immune system is, has already engaged with the cancer to some degree, but it's failed to win that battle as the cancer is growing. And what, what we're trying to do with interventions is to try to train the immune system again to overcome that cancer so that you can sort of win the, win the medal of, of fighting off the cancer and being a cancer survivor. And this, fortunately, there are now tools to do that, but it all comes down really to your, your own body, um, what you have in your body being trained or re-engineered to do what it could, can, can otherwise not quite do, but has the ability to do ultimately. So the, the immune system is a complicated system, as you know. There are lots of components of it. We can think of the, so the effector arms of it in, in several categories, thinking about antibodies and T lymphocytes, and we call them T cells, and they can be killer T cells and helper T cells, and there are lots of other subsets. But, and we focus mostly on T cells. They recognize specific targets on the surface of cancer cells, and as um, Dr. Schnell talked about, they're, they're short, short peptides that are bound to other molecules on the surface called MHC molecules. And this is a dramatic um, microscopic view of a tumor cell and then these lymphocytes, um, which we call white blood cells. You know, they're, they're a type of white blood cell, and they can directly recognize and kill cancer. And one of the, um, one of the again, the sort of challenges, and you've heard about it a bit, is that lymphocytes, T lymphocytes in particular, are found in a lot of cancers, but those are you know, in cancers that are growing. Um, people that have those lymphocytes in them tend to do better than those who don't, but it's still um, at some level a, a representation of failure of those T cells to work if they're in the cancer and the cancer is still growing. So the goal of a lot of immune therapy at one level is to just to try to reinvigorate or retrain, if you will, those lymphocytes to recognize cancer and to get back to their mission. Some of that work is being done by giving the checkpoint blockade molecules that you've heard a lot about and that we're all very excited about, um, and that's doing it inside the patient by giving a drug that changes that. Um, the other approach, or another approach, is what's called adoptive T-cell therapy or adoptive cellular therapy where those cells are taken out of the body and then kind of re-engineered or retrained and put back in. A lot of this work has been done at the National Cancer Institute, but now is being done in other settings. Um, and one approach is to use what's called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. That's taking the cells that are in the tumor already um, by taking out the tumor, isolating those cells, growing them up, and giving them back. And, and we find that, or it has been found, that if you activate them with fairly straightforward techniques, you can get them to work again. Um, other approaches are to add a gene that's missing or that just isn't, you know, wasn't there to begin with that can induce the T cell to make a T cell receptor 
or a modified T-cell receptor that can then recognize a target antigen that would enable it to kill the cancer. And there are a couple of approaches for doing that. One is just engineering a T-cell receptor that's been developed from someone else whose T-cells can work. The other is to make something called a chimeric antigen receptor, which you may have heard about, but this is a, a, a sort of an engineered antibody bound to a modified T-cell receptor. And there's a lot of excitement about these as well, but the general concept is similar. It's all taking the patient's own cells, retraining or re-engineering them, and putting them back in a way that they can work. And this has been very effective in, in melanoma. In particular, um, this is work from the National Cancer Institute with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that have been re-engineered and put back in. And a large tumor in the chest wall has um, pretty much gone away. A really huge tumor in the pelvis has dramatically shrunk. Many, many liver metastases, these little black dots, um, have gone away. And these, these sorts of effects are quite dramatic. The therapy is, is an aggressive therapy. Um, but the, the benefits have been impressive. Um, this is the overall survival data um, from a few years ago with patients who were treated with this approach. With, there are some other components of it that are built in, but they've, they've seen that um, overall about 20 to 20, 20 to 30 percent of patients are still alive nine years later, which is a pretty impressive thing, and most of those people are still free of disease at that point and may well be cured. Um, so the so summary, I'm obviously not going to go through in this time everything that's known about adoptive T-cell therapy, but just in brief, this TIL therapy has been associated with a 50 to 70 percent response rate, which is quite impressive, about 25 percent durable survival, but this is mostly for melanoma. The CAR T-cells have been in the news a lot, and, if, and you, you may have heard about it some already, um, 90 percent response rate in acute lymphocytic leukemia. Um, and a similar, the, the cars that do that, not the CD19 cars, can induce um, regressions in other kinds of lymphomas and leukemias, and they're being studied now or developed for work in other cancers, um, both more lymphomas and leukemias as well as solid tumors. There will be some challenges in that, but it's an exciting area. And then the T-cell receptor transduced T-cells have had very dramatic effects. In selected cancers, again, there are some challenges in designing these optimally, but there's a lot of promise in this. Um, and there is a question about whether this could be made more effective by um, helping to change the tumor microenvironment in ways that you've heard about by giving them in addition to PD-1 blockade or PD-L1 blockade or other combination approaches. So these studies are underway and I think will be important in future directions. At this point, none of these approaches are FDA approved, um, but they are having impact in clinical trials and we're going to see, I'm sure, a lot more of it. The next thing I want to talk about is cancer vaccines. The concept of a vaccine to activate your immune system inside you to, um, and to recognize cancer is an appealing one, and there's been work done in this area for a long time, arguably over 100 years, um, but especially over the past few decades. The results, a, a lot of the results have been somewhat disappointing. It's an area where I spend a lot of my energy, um, but there's, I think, a lot of promise and need for doing this kind of work. There is one vaccine that's been approved, and you've, you've heard about Provenge, right? So Provenge reduces the risk of recurrence and improves survival in patients with advanced prostate cancer. The benefit is um, significant. There's still a lot of people that need help, but it's, it certainly has been shown to have an effect. There are other approaches, and they, there's a range of things you can do. One is, of course, to take out cancer cells and to activate or to add something that can um, can induce an immune response, mix that together and give it back as a vaccine. The other is just to, in, to add something as an immune activator directly into the tumor, so it's a vaccine in place. We call it an in situ vaccination. Um, and there's been some work done in cutaneous T cell lymphoma with an, with an immune activator called a TLR9 agonist plus radiation therapy, all given into that site. Um, and this is a clinical trial based on some mouse data, and this is in cutaneous T cell lymphoma with um, regression of tumors, this would be considered significant. So a regression of tumors that are significant in some patients and at least stabilization or minor shrinkage in other patients and um, actual improvement that's seen from here to here. Um, and there's other work that's been done um, showing that giving the CTLA-4 antibody ipilimumab may help it directly into the tumor, may also help make this work better. And so there are clinical trials studying that now. And I think this kind of approach is one which will be exciting going forward, and you may have heard the, the news, and it was probably been mentioned already today, uh, that this TVAC, the intralesional uh, oncolytic virus that's injected uh, in, into melanoma metastases can cause shrinkage of tumor, and in a clinical trial induced 
objective um, complete responses in 10% of patients and partial response in 16%, which was better than a control with GMCSF, and durable benefit um, in 16% of patients compared to 2%. In the subset of patients with just skin or subcutaneous or lymph node metastases, um, the, the patients treated with this compared to this control group had significant improvement, and that is what has led to approval of this um, agent. So we'll see more and more of these kinds of things. This, is a, this has complicated effects because it has direct effect on the tumor, but there's evidence that it will induce an immune response more globally. So it functions at least partially as a vaccine. And we'll see that going forward, as I say. So in situ vaccination is an approach. There are a number of things that can be done um, with radiation, chemotherapy, and immune activators um, to create this sort of effect. Um, the other general approach, and I'm not going to go into great detail, is to try to identify the target antigens on a cancer specifically for a given patient, because a lot of work's been done identifying antigens or target antigens that are known to be present in lots of different people's cancers and using those to vaccinate, and I believe that still is a reasonable place to go, but vaccinating with a mutated, against a mutated protein that's unique to your own cancer um, has particular appeal. and. There's a lot of excitement about developing that going forward. So you can imagine, and, and we're, this is starting to be done, um, creating cocktails of peptides or RNA that encodes um, these proteins that are uniquely present in a patient's own tumor based on the mutations that are there, potentially also selecting from a large library of, of antigens that are known to be present in a given cancer, um, but just choosing the ones that you know are in that patient's cancer and giving that as a personalized uh, vaccine. There are regulatory hurdles to developing, to getting approval for a drug for a given patient, but there, this I think will be overcome, and there already is evidence that it can be. It's more costly, but if it's effective, it's a great thing to do. And again, there's some early proof of principle. Um, and then again, there are clinical trials testing all of these kinds of approaches, both as vaccines alone and in combination. And there's a lot of reason to believe that giving them in combination with agents that change the tumor microenvironment will be more effective than giving them by themselves. So that's a lot of the area of future direction. So in thinking then about the challenge that um, has, has been presented is, is how to deal with um, this, you know, how to, how to move forward with all the agents we have. It is amazing that if you think about what was actually FDA approved for treatment of cancer, through 2010, um, it was very little. Basically, you could cut it out. As a surgeon, I'd do that, and we can cure people if we cut it out early enough. Um, and there are some, obviously, chemotherapy and radiation are done, but they rarely ca have caused complete durable benefit in patients except for a few cancers. Um, and so immune therapy adds a lot of new tools, and has been shown the benefits that those new tools provide um, have provided durable benefit in a large subset of patients. So it's really a whole new world. And you know, each of these different tools that's available has been, well, each of these has been talked about. Dr. Schnoll showed a list that's about five times that big that includes things that aren't approved yet. These are all basically approved agents. Um, and, how, and selecting among them is challenging, certainly going forward. And I would come back to, I wasn't here for it, but the, I know you had a talk about biomarkers, and there's been some discussion about them along the way. And this is clearly going to be important going forward, as has been discussed. The, um, probably the, the best biomarker we have right now for, for defining likely to response is PDL1 expression for people getting PD1 blockade, but even that's not an ideal marker. Um, but clearly, being able to, if you can identify a marker that can help guide therapy that's useful and it is being used in some settings, more and more we want to do that. And if, if you look at um, uh, some cancers, this is melanoma, about less than 10 percent, 8 or 9 percent of melanomas will have a diffuse infiltrate of lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are stained blue here, these light blue staining cells. The brown stained cells are melanoma cells. And you can see that throughout here there aren't many tumor cells that don't have a lymphocyte right next to them. These are the tumors that that tend to do, the patients that tend to do well um, long term, even without therapy, and those tend to be the ones that express PDL1 and tend to respond to immune therapies. Um, there are lymphocytes in other tumors, but there we describe what we call immunotype A and B. This immunotype A is about a quarter to a third of melanomas, and these have no lymphocytes at all. This stain is a purple stain, is blood vessels, and there are really no lymphocytes in here. But even this group, which has a lot of lymphocytes that are shown here, they're all right along blood vessels, and they're not really getting into the tumor. You can see most of these tumors don't have a lymphocyte in 
in sight or nearby. So you can imagine that really over 90% of melanomas don't have a lot, a lot of access for the lymphocytes to the tumor. So being able to get T cells into the tumor is, is critical, and this is true for a lot of other cancers as well. And so I'll just sort of end with a provocative kind of way to think about how we may want to design things going forward. This is a schematic concept only because we don't have enough data now to drive this kind of trial design, but this kind of design is starting to be employed. So you can imagine a patient with advanced melanoma who doesn't have a BRAF mutation, so that's not an option. PD-1 antibody typically is the thing we choose first. Um, and you can imagine saying, well, if we'll give them that first, and if they have a clinical response, then we continue PD-1 antibody. Um, and then a lot of those people still have residual cancer, and right now we tend to either continue to treat with PD-1 PD antibody or just follow, and a lot of those people will have stable disease for a while, but you can imagine that if they have residual cancer, at some point that may come back. So we might say, well, should we take those out? And sometimes that's happening. When things left, we take it out. Um, but we might say, let's see if there are a lot of lymphocytes in there, and if there aren't a lot of lymphocytes, then maybe the immune system is not going to be able to do much more, and we can do surgery, or maybe we add an intralesional therapy to, to try to change the tumor microenvironment to bring T cells in. Um, if there are a lot of T cells there, then maybe we add a cancer vaccine or some other immune therapy and measure if there's a response. If they don't have a response to the PD-1 antibody, then adding CTLA-4 antibody. Um, again, there are different ways of playing this, but this would be one way. Um, and if they do have a response, that's great. If they don't, then you might ask if they have high numbers of other, th other components that might block the immune response, like regulatory T cells. And there are things, um, a CD27 antibody has been shown to decrease regulatory T cells. Maybe that would work. Maybe there are a number of other things that have been suggested that may help. And then you might give that. If they don't have that, then you might be able to give interleukin-2, um, which is an old drug that's been around. It helps in some patients, but may also increase regulatory T cells. So this kind of paradigm or thinking like that, I think, is where we would like to be able to go. But all that's going to require a lot more research to understand the best biomarkers to define each stage and then to be able to, um, to apply that to application in patient care. And so in, in summary, um, you know, I think it's, it's just important to realize that as a cancer evolves in a patient, there is this constant battle between the immune system and the cancer that leads to what's present when, when the cancer is there, and will continue to make that evolve over time. Different cancers have different weaknesses that we want to uh, take advantage of. And fortunately, we now have tools that can overcome a lot of the challenges that cancers present and can retrain um, and re-engineer our immune systems to, to respond to those. So the future of cancer immunotherapy involves making these new combinations and new therapies that are designed based on good data about what are good markers for the key biologic effects and that can predict response to therapy. And obviously we hope that will lead to, to new therapies that can help each patient. Thank you.